welcome everyone to the uh, HFI Tech Lunch. Uh, today's 19th November, and our last Tech Lunch was about the new KEB standards for uh, charcoal and carbonized briquettes. And today, like extending from that, I want to do a quick uh, introduction on carbonization. So this is part one. I think probably at least we'll do two parts and maybe even three parts. Um, unfortunately, we won't today go into the different technologies and approaches to carbonization because I want to just do a quick kind of background um, to prepare us for that. So the goals for the talk, I'll just do a quick maybe 15, 20 minute talk here and then uh, we'll just open it up for some discussion. Our goals for the talk are just to do some um, background on combustion. So we will um, kind of condense what could be a full course over a whole term into just a, a few minutes if we can if that's possible to do we'll we'll make an attempt and um so lay out some i guess common language and just some easy concepts to think about with combustion um knowing that combustion it takes us kind of all the way and we're stopping only part way with carbonization so then just discussing these terms, pyrolysis, carbonization, and torrefaction. Um, some of those might be already familiar, but maybe not. Then some background for an upcoming tech lunch on carbonization technologies. So I think that's what we'll aim for next month. Uh, we'll be really kind of looking into what are the different options. So I hope we are well prepared for that. Um, and then we'll finish with some discussion. So any questions or yeah, any points that weren't clear, we can uh, take those during the discussion part. Um, okay. So I, I was going to do a little bit of polling, but we don't have a lot of participants today. So I think we'll just skip the polling and, you know, I'll just ask them at the end. Um, so just to lead off, I did want to show a few of the things that we're talking about when we when we say carbonization i think probably most people that are going to watch this already are familiar with several of these and maybe there's a few things that aren't looking very familiar but when we talk about carbonization we we mean in this case um, the conversion of biomass or a waste carbonized into a carbon rich material we call char so you can see in the drum kiln up here um, this uh, kiln full of sugar cane bagasse has been already carbonized and we can see the product which uh, we call char let me just bring something here yeah and so there's a few other ways of doing it. Um, so the drum kiln can kind of be improved. This is a, a kiln at Khmer Green Charcoal in Cambodia. And there's been some improvements on that. So we're going to talk about kind of some more specifics around that next time. So sorry if that's what you're hoping for. The traditional way of carbonizing is in earthen pits. So in general, the idea here is we're trying to limit the amount of oxygen. We'll talk a little bit about that later. But uh, so you can use a drum, you can use an earthen pit, you can use some more sophisticated designs. Um, but they all are basically trying to achieve the same end and trying to uh, maximize the quantity of char produced in the end. So we talked already in in a couple tech lunches ago we talked about uh, composition and we looked into some different ways to formulate the composition to represent the composition and one of the important things is the fixed carbon and we actually we spoke a little bit about how fixed carbon is measured 
Um, and basically fixed carbon, and we'll just a reminder on that, fixed carbon is the, the residue remaining after pyrolyzing or removing all the volatile matter, pyrolyzing or devolatilizing. So the fixed carbon is actually a good representation of what we could probably expect um, in an ideal scenario from our kiln for carbonizing. So generally what's left is the fixed carbon and the ash. So all this kind of gets connected back to composition. Where did we start with the original uh, biomass or feedstock? Okay, so um, I wanted a few of these not to show up. So the way I like to start is uh, talking about combustion and something called the, the fire triangle. And let me just, I meant to make it so that these didn't show up right away. But, um, okay. So this should be better now. Yeah. And this is, I think, going to be familiar to a lot of us. So it's, it's kind of a very elementary concept, but I think one of the things we need to remember is we need three components to make fire. Um, so an easy way to think about that is in a triangle. You can't only have two out of the three. So you need heat, fuel, and oxygen. And so uh, one example I like to think about is when you go to the petrol station, the fuel station, and you spill a little bit of gasoline or petrol on the ground you maybe see like a puddle of it or some drops and some people get really worried like when they see you know a small spill of petrol or something um thinking you know it could just spontaneously combust or something but we need to remember there's only two parts of the fire triangle there we have the fuel which is spilled out the oxygen is just in the air around but we need a heat source, or actually what I usually call this is an ignition source. So oxygen, fuel, and an ignition all need to be pre present. So if, uh, yeah, somebody flicks a cigarette, and like in the movies, you know, then we actually get the, the big, uh, usually not a big expo explosion, actually, more just like a flame, but um, then that can happen. But without all three, you can't have fire. So in the case of you know some of the products we're thinking about, fuel is the briquettes, uh, air introduced you know through um, some ventilation in the cook stove, and then some ignition source. Probably you need more than just these matchsticks to ignite the briquettes, but you get the idea. Um, so actually a matchstick is kind of a nice example to think about combustion. Um, so the, the thing that we want to, the point that we want to get across here is there's multiple processes happening. So you've heard about pyrolysis, you've heard about gasification, and you've heard about combustion. And actually in a matchstick or in any fire really, especially with a solid fuel like this, uh, you actually have all three things happening simultaneously. So the way that it works mainly is, I mean, so we had the tip of the match, which causes the ignition. So we completed the fire triangle. And then as the match burns down, it's actually not the, the stick itself that makes a luminous flame. So the main point here is it's the pyrolysis or the devolatilization of the stick so all of the components of the wood that can boil out. So those exit as pyrolysis gas, we kind of lump all of those things together. And they actually enter the flame region, which was initiated by this, the tip of the stick and con continues as long as there's pyro uh, combustible pyrolysis gas flowing into it. So those actually ignite and combust um, to produce a, a visible flame, or they, they call it a luminous uh, burning gases. That's basically the flame zone. And then you have combustion products. 
So the reactions, most of the reactions occur during this flame zone, and then you're left over with you know, whatever products are there, CO2 or particulate matter, water vapor, other things. And then the residue that's left over at the end, that's the char. So we're pyrolyzing the stick. The pyrolysis gases burn in a flame and emit light as they burn. And then combustion products rise up in a hot plume above the match, right? If you hold your hand above the match, you feel the hot gases rising because of buoyancy, right? Hot combustion gases have um, uh, low density compared to the air, so they would rise. And the interesting thing is, so the triangle, you're maybe wondering where does the air, where does the oxygen come from? So a match is what we call a diffusion flame. Um, meaning it doesn't have a lot of, doesn't have a lot of mixing and turbulence in it. It's sort of just a, a nice stable flame. And actually the, the motion of the rising gases actually pulls in a little bit of air. We know that when gases rise up by what we call conservation of mass, we need something to release those. And so actually, the rising motion of gases actually swirls in a little bit of air, diffuses in a little bit of air and oxygen into the flame. That's that's a whole other subject. But so we have all three pieces present. Right? We have a standing flame. We have pyrolysis gases entering that. We have air containing oxygen diffusing into the flame. So this is just a nice way to think about combustion. It's actually a combination of pyrolysis. Um, gasification, where you produce combustible gases from a solid with a little bit of oxygen, and then combustion. And finally, your emissions or your products exiting from the top. Um, so yeah, you can use that in the future too. So there's, uh, I'm just going to briefly talk about oxidation as another term. Um, so combustion basically is an oxidation reaction. In chemistry, we can have uh, reduction or oxidation. So the very generic version of combustion, especially with carbonized fuels, briquettes, coal, charcoal, etc., mainly carbon-containing fuels. So the very, very simple way of of talking about that reaction for combusting the fuel, which we represent just with carbon, we re we have a reaction with oxygen. So these are our reactants on the left side of the equation here. So carbon and oxygen in the air. So we're kind of simplifying air to just oxygen. Goes on to produce uh, carbon dioxide and a lot of heat. That's the other piece that's not represented. So we combust carbon, we produce CO2. Very straightforward. CO2 obviously is a greenhouse gas. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to limit emissions of CO2, but we'll see actually it's, it's better if we produce CO2 than all of these other incomplete combustion products. So. Let's just look at the case that when we don't go all the way to produce CO2, let's say we don't have enough oxygen. So very simple, it's pretty straightforward here, right? We're making an assumption we've now only introduced half of the oxygen. And now, so instead of fully oxidizing the carbon with a nice full oxygen atom, we kind of get stuck halfway. And so we just produce CO, carbon monoxide. And so this is a, an incomplete combustion reaction. And the products, for this simplified case, it's just CO. But if we had a more complicated fuel, say it was, um, you know, methane, which is CH4, so it would have four hydrogen atoms, then we would end up with a little bit different um, mix of products, not just CO but also, yeah, some other uh, hydrogen-containing uh, products. Uh, we may have an even more complicated 
uh, fuel like wood or sugar cane bagasse, something like that. And um, so the products get even more complicated, especially when we have too little oxygen. We don't fully oxidize the fuel and we end up with a lot of what we call PICs, P-I-C, products of incomplete combustion. And so those those actually can be a lot worse than CO2. So we know actually methane could be a product of incomplete combustion from a, a hydrocarbon fuel, like a CXHY type fuel. Uh, methane can be a, a product, and methane we know is actually a very potent greenhouse gas, way more uh, powerful than CO2, and having a much worse effect uh, on, on the atmosphere and the climate. So the main point here is we just want to know what's the effect of too little oxygen and not fully, fully oxidizing. So for the briquettes, we really want this uppercase when we finally use them in a GECO or a cook stove. For carbonization, on the other hand, we actually maybe don't want all of this oxygen entering into the kiln. Right, because we don't want to just produce CO2, we also want to produce char. Um, maybe we want to produce combustible gases like CO to make heat uh, for our, our uh, pyrolysis reactor. We'll get into some more of that, I think, in the next talk. But just to introduce a few basic concepts about combustion, the fire triangle, uh, oxidation, and that matchstick example. So I'm just going to then put kind of a complicated diagram up. I apologize for this, but I want to try to tie everything together a little bit. And we're actually just going to use this diagram to sort of follow a fuel particle. Um, interestingly, this is from my uh, PhD research back in 2012. Uh, so. I use this to kind of explain a part of the process I was studying on my PhD. So we have a particle of fuel, this is maybe a piece of wood, and we know as we heat it up, it's going to go through a series of processes. And I've kind of called those drying, devolatilization, and gasification. Remember, we can say devolatilization is sort of like pyrolysis. It actually, you could call them synonymous. So drying, the main product is moisture, we're adding heat. Then devolatilization, the diagram is a little misleading. So we devolatilize the fuel particle, lose volatiles, devolatile. We lose the volatiles and the tars. So those sort of boil out of the biomass. We're left with a char particle, right? Now, as we continue, we add more heat. In this case, I was adding in some uh, steam to introduce a little bit of oxygen. Then we enter this gasification regime. So now our volatiles, our char, they react and go on to produce a different set of products. And in the end, we're pretty much just left with ash in this case. So in carbonization, we're sort of freezing at this point, right? We'll produce a bunch of volatiles and tars probably, uh, and then we'll be left with the char particle, right? So we have to go through these two steps though, pyrolysis, and at least partially we need to go through, if not fully, devolatilization, taking all the volatile matter out. Um, so, that kind of gives you the general idea in terms of carbonization. Um, I actually made a little graphic, which I'm going to show also. And I'm going to pull up a different slide. It kind of takes us through the same process, but um, in a little bit different way. And back a few years ago, I spent a lot of time making this animation, and it, it kind of looks like a 2005 animation, but um, I still like to show it. <laughs> so, uh, let me just make sure it's here. Yeah. All 
Okay, so this is pretty much the last thing I'm going to show today, and then we will um, just make sure we're sharing everything. Okay, so same kind of idea. We have a pile of wood to start with. And so we're going to represent what I call the product distribution up here. So right now, we haven't done anything to the wood. We have 100% feedstock. The wood is the feedstock. So what we're going to do is we're going to follow, we're looking at three different things in these scales. The first one I call conversion process. So we're going to go through each process, drying, pyrolysis, gasification, and combustion. And remember with the match, we kind of think about those in a sequence. We first dry, the match obviously is already dry. We then pyrolyze, we produce gases. Gasification, we have some reaction between the char and the gases and some oxygen uh, to produce more gases. And then combustion, we produce a bunch of heat. Um, so then the other thing here is a reaction temperature. As the wood heats up, we kind of go through each of these stages. And then the last thing I haven't really talked about, but stoichiometric ratio, it's a funny word, but it's basically an indication of do we have enough oxygen to fully combust, right? So a stoichiometric ratio of one means theoretically you have enough oxygen present that you should be able to fully combust um, your fuel all the way to CO2 or CO2 and water vapor, you know, those very simple products from oxidation. Okay. So let's just see what happens to our pile of wood as we start to heat it up. So the first step, we start to dry it out, right? So usually early on is when we do, is we see this in carbonization too. Early on, you get these big billowing um, uh, plumes of steam, basically water vapor exiting out of your kiln. So a little bit of our feedstock has now come out and come out as water vapor, H2O. So our temperature has now gone up to about 100 C. We don't have any oxygen going in though, right? We're not actively push, pushing oxygen in. Actually, the, the release of steam maybe even displaced any air that was in the kiln already in our pile of wood, right? Okay, so the next step, now we go through pyrolysis. So we remember from the last slide that we, after pyrolysis, we're pretty much just left with char uh, remaining from our original wood, char and ash, maybe a little bit of uh, volatiles if we didn't fully pyrolyze. So this could take us anywhere from about, about 200 up to 600 C. So there's a big range of temperatures for pyrolysis. And Usually pyrolysis is, is at zero oxygen. Actually, by definition, it should be at zero oxygen. Sometimes, you know, maybe a little bit of air or oxygen will leak in. Um, but by definition, it should be a zero oxygen environment. Now, once we start to get a little bit more oxygen and then we enter what we call gasification. And in this stage, we produce uh, as the name suggests, we produce a lot of gases. So we might push our reaction beyond pyrolysis into gasification. Say if we wanted to make something like, you know, LPG or natural gas or CNG, compressed natural gas, maybe we wanted to produce something like that instead of char. So we would try to enter into this gasification regime. So usually that's higher temperature. Um, the higher the temperature in general, the more gas we produce instead of solids like char. And now we're definitely introducing some oxygen, either through steam, like I showed in the other slide, maybe through a little bit of air. We're pushing a little bit of air into the kiln. And um, 
And from this, we would expect to get a lot less char because now we're, we're producing so much more gas. The char and ash, some of the char we're consuming to make more gas, like that carbon monoxide reaction. Right? So then finally, if we can introduce enough air, we'll raise the temperature and we'll burn everything away to a pile of ash. So we'll complete um, this process with combustion. We've now introduced enough oxygen, finally, that all of the char pretty much has burned away. We're left with a pile of ash, and our gas is actually mainly just CO2, maybe some water vapor, but um, very complete combustion here. Um, we're always driving out a little bit of water vapor from uh, from our drying step. So I think I left that in throughout. So that gives us a little bit of background. So again, carbonization is mainly where we're just focused on pyrolysis. Some of our kiln designs actually will uh, involve introducing a little bit of oxygen. So we actually may have some gasification there too. So these two things can be happening kind of sim simultaneously um, in our char making kilns. Okay, so we'll just go back to uh, the other presentation quickly. There's one other term that I wanted to introduce very briefly because I think it's coming up more often and we may see it actually come uh, I think come into play in a bigger way in our sector. And so that term is torrefaction. And you may have heard of torrefaction. This is just my definition. I think there's a few others, but torrefaction, the way I like to think of it is it's low temperature, mild pyrolysis. Um, and one of the main goals of torrefaction is to increase the energy density and make the biomass more resistant to biodegradation. So if you had to keep it or transport it for long, uh, try, uh, torrefaction is a good approach. It's a lot like, I mean, it's, it is pyrolysis basically, but it's a subset of pyrolysis in a, a lower temperature, um, regime. So actually this is some work that I did a while ago. I, uh, we did some experiments where we torrefied, uh, wood chips. And so I, I'm just showing here what it looked like, uh, going from raw wood to then wood that's been torrefied. We did torrefaction. We torrefied the wood at 300 C and torrefaction at 330 C. Uh, there's not a huge difference, but you might notice that it's, you know, a little more charred a little darker in color. Um, I like to think of torrefaction kind of like um, coffee, like coffee roasting. So some people like, you know, a, a medium roast. Some people like a dark roast. Some people like a, a light roast. And so torrefaction can kind of cover those different levels of roasting, right? Um, so here actually was some experiments that one of the D-Lab students did and wrote a paper about um, actually making briquettes from lightly torrefied and heavily torrefied. Um, I think in this case it was sawdust. And then a wood charcoal briquette as sort of the, the comparison. Um, so torrefaction is interesting. You actually, like, especially when we're in the lighter roast, lightly torrefied, you actually still have a lot of kind of the raw feedstock. Like in this case, I can still see kind of unconverted wood or uncarbonized wood. Um, and that may be favorable for some applications, right? We definitely know we've dried out the wood. We know we've removed some of those lighter hydrocarbons, we've pyrolyzed out. And this is probably going to be more energy dense. So if we're looking at transportation, you know, it's more economical transport something that has more energy per sack or per basin um, and it's gonna when we finally do use it if we use it for briquettes it's gonna have you know different characteristics different properties than 
say, the very dark wood charcoal, right? Um, or char dust. This would be like the char dust briquette. So I just wanted to introduce that term. There's some references uh, here in the slides, which I'll share, um, which you could follow up on to learn more about torrefaction. Um, but uh, generally speaking, it is just you know pyrolysis, but at a lower temperature. Okay, so just to kind of recap, I just wanted to go over a few of these terms and make sure that we define them uh, correctly. So combustion, most of us are familiar with that. It's a thermal process. All of these are thermal processes. When the fuel reacts with oxygen, we produce heat, water vapor, carbon dioxide, and sometimes a few other products. But if we're doing a good job, it's pretty much just those three things. A lot of heat, a little bit of water vapor, a little bit of CO2. So pyrolysis is the degradation of a fuel in an inert environment, no oxygen, at elevated temperature and sometimes pressure. Why do we say degradation? Well, you're removing the volatile matter, the volatile content, uh, volatile, sorry. And so I think of that as like a thermal degradation. It would degrade, biodegrade anyway in the environment. We're kind of accelerating that a little bit. Um, inert is another important term. So usually there's no oxygen, right? So uh, in our charcoal kiln, the inert environment usually is created just because we have a lot of other gaseous species being produced. So really there's no space for oxygen to enter. So in, in the case of a, a carbonizer, the inert environment is usually just made because all the oxygen gets d displaced with water vapor, steam, volatile gases, tars, a bunch of all these things that are burning out of the wood. So torrefaction, I just talked about, that's the mild pyrolysis, your light roast or medium roast, you can think of it. And finally, you get a nice dry, energy dense product compared to the raw feedstock. Oh, another thing that people like about torrefied material is you can easily crush it, right? Once you torrefy wood, instead of it being this really hard thing to mill or re reduce in size, now it's a lot easier. Um, the last term I wanted to mention, I'm not, I think I said it a couple of times, but I don't think I really explained it, is yield. So especially when um, we're talking about pyrolysis and carbonization, the yield or the amount of product remaining after the process is a, a really important thing to understand. Um, so it, usually the way that we talk about yield, like if you were to say char yield, uh, we usually express yield as a fraction or a percentage of the input, the feedstock, the raw material. So an example sentence here is, the drum kiln has a char yield of 15 kilograms per 100 kilograms of maize cobs. Right, so I've represented our char that we produce through carbonization, 15 kg, as a fraction of the initial 100 kg of maize cobs. You could also say that the yield, the char yield was 15%. That would also be correct. Or 0 0.15 um, out of 1. So now you can also have a gas yield. It's not just char, right? We have gases that are part of uh, the products. So you have a gaseous yield, you have a char yield, an ash yield, all of those things. So all the yields, all the product yields combine to 100%. Um, Okay, uh, I just I have one resource that I really like for kind of this introductory material. There's a book by uh, Prabir Basu, and it covers biomass ga gasification and pyrolysis, practical design. But he has some really good introductory chapters, and in general, most of the books by this guy are, are really good.
Um, so yeah, if you're able to find that, if you need help finding that, I think I can uh, help you at least with a couple of the chapters, which I already have. And I think that's all I had. Sorry, that was a little longer than I expected, but um, thanks so much and feel free to be in touch. And I'm going to hang around now in case um, anyone has any questions or points to discuss.